Secretary Liu, Secretary Chow, Ambassadors Chin, Hills, Gung, Elliot, Huang, Locke, Negroponte, Admiral Davidson, colleagues and friends. It is wonderful to see so many of you in person today. We worried that we would hold a gala and no one would come. But you have and you've filled the room and I thank each and every one of you for being here and supporting us. During the past 21 months, I've often been inspired by the words of the Confucian philosopher, Shunzi, whom I read as an undergraduate studying Chinese history. In the first chapter of his anthology, titled Chenxue, Encouraging Learning, he said, for those who didn't get that, achievement consists of never giving up. If you start carving and then give up, you cannot even cut through a piece of rotten wood. But if you persist without, start, without stopping, you can carve or inlay metal or stone. 21 months ago, no one would have blamed us for giving up. COVID-19 was killing thousands of Americans a day. U.S.-China relations were experiencing problems not seen since before the establishment of diplomatic relations. People-to-people -people exchanges were stopped, and we could not work in our office. Not only did we not give up, the staff, the board, and members of the National Committee redoubled our efforts and have had an impact far beyond what we could have imagined in March of 2020. Our programming went from in-person to online. Rather than reaching hundreds, we now reach tens of thousands. It took us 10 years to reach a million views of our programming. Now it takes less than six months. Our China Town Hall not only had 88 venues in America, China, and the United Kingdom, it has already been viewed by over 480,000 people. Rather than suspending our track two dialogues on strategic, economic, healthcare, maritime, rule of law and digital economy issues, we have added a green finance track to, and our mornings and nights are filled with discussions that are a vital channel when government-to-government -government discussions are challenged. The consensus documents emanating from these discussions help our two governments develop policies that benefit both countries. We cannot rem run congressional member and staff delegations to China these days. So on many evenings, we gather those who would we see in Beijing on Zoom to meet with congressional staff in Washington. We selected our seventh cohort of public intellectuals from among America's outstanding young China experts in academia. We now have 140 pippers, which we like to call our public intellectuals, around the country trying to educate Americans about China and US-China relations. These accomplishments and many others have been made possible by an imaginative and devoted staff, a committed board, and every one of you. Because of all of you, I am proud to announce that tonight we have raised in excess of $2.6 million.
finally, a word about Mingxie, our honoree tonight. His contributions to America and U.S.-China relations more than justify the honor we are awarding him tonight. But we also chose Ming because he represents what immigration from China means to the United States. In the past several years, we have seen increasing restrictions on that immigration. And I have often wondered, would Ming have been able to come in 1980 if those rules had been in place? So tonight, we honor Ming and the enormous contributions that immigrants from China have made to America. Let me close with the last lines of the Tang Dynasty's greatest poet, Li Bai, from his poem, Xing Lunan, in English, The Difficult Road. Chang Fang Po Lang Hui Yo Shi, Zhi Gua Yun Fan, Ji Tang Hai. Translated, someday, with my sail piercing the clouds, we will mount the wind, break the waves, and traverse the vast rolling sea. Because of your support, because of the support of every one of you here tonight, we will traverse this difficult road and strengthen the relationship that will determine the peace and prosperity of the 21st century. I thank you. Now, normally at this point, I would introduce the father of modern U.S.-China relations, America's 56th Secretary of State, and a man who needs no introduction to this audience to talk about the state of U.S.-China relations. Of course, it's Dr. Henry Kissinger. He, along with our other executive vice chairman, Hank Greenberg, can't be with us tonight, but we rejoice that Henry and Hank are both in good health, and we are thankful that Henry created a short video for tonight's gala. I look forward every year to this event of the National Committee because of the tremendous contribution the National Committee makes to perhaps the most important aspect of international affairs today. It is essential for China and the United States to overcome their difficulties. It is even more important for China and the United States to find some common projects on which they can cooperate for common purposes. And above all, it is important for China and the United States to understand that in the world in which we're living today, there can be no national victors in national contexts. There is a imperative for finding a road to coexistence and cooperation. The National Committee it's composed of individuals that are dedicated to that purpose. And it is a great pleasure for me to have an opportunity to say a few words to them. In particular, on this occasion, we have to pay tribute 
the Chinese American who have come to this country, or whose family has come to this country. I'm an immigrant myself, but I know how difficult the adjustment is and how important it is to benefit from the thinking of different cultures that are merging in this country. And it is a particular privilege to be here when Mr. Mengxian is the honorary on this occasion. Mr. Mengxian has tremendous life experience in coming to this country and becoming a distinguished CEO who is on the board of great American institutions and who has joined the board of the National Committee. And we look forward to working with him, and we thank him for the willingness to join this important and crucial task that we are trying to contribute to. Thank you very much. We're live streaming this. I don't know if Henry can hear me, but uh, thank you, and we hope to see you in person uh, at next year's gala. Next, let me welcome one of America's great public servants, the former Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, who in addition to being a partner at Lindsey Goldberg and a professor at Columbia's SEPA, is now chairman of the National Committee, and he will read a letter from President Biden. Thanks so much, Steve, uh, and thank you, Secretary Kissinger, for opening our session with those words. We all look forward to seeing you uh, here in person next year. And I welcome all of you, and we'll have some additional remarks in a few moments when we go through the program. But I'm privileged now uh, to read a message from uh, President Biden uh, on this occasion. And it's dated, uh, The White House. I send greetings to everyone gathered for the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations 2021 Gala Dinner. For over 50 years, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations has promoted cooperation between the United States and China, helping foster mutual understanding and constructive conversation to help find common ground. Today, our world is at an inflection point in history. From tackling the COVID-19 pandemic to addressing the existential threat of the climate crisis, the relationship between the United States and China has global significance. Solving these challenges and seizing opportunities will require the broader international community to come together as we each do our part to build a safe, peaceful, and resilient future. I'm grateful for your dedication to strengthening the bonds between the people of our two countries. Through the advocacy of organizations like yours, we can seek greater connectivity and advancement of interests that affect our countries and the world. Signed, President Biden. A few weeks ago, we lost Colin Powell, a friend to many in this room. He said, quote, diplomacy is listening to what the other guy says, needs. Preserving your own positioning, but listening to the other guy. You have to develop relationships with other people so when tough times come, you can work together. I met Ching Gang in 2015 when President Xi visited the United States. I then got to watch him daily as spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as he preserved his and China's position. Since arriving in the United States as China's ambassador, I have watched 
Ambassador Chin preserve China's position while still listening and developing relationships with people. So when the tough times come, as they have, we can work together. We are pleased that he has chosen this as his first major public event in the United States and welcome him to read a letter from President Xi and make some remarks. Welcome, my friend, Ambassador Chin. Secretary Jacob Liu, Secretary Elaine Chao, Mr. Stephen Orleans, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good evening. It gives me great pleasure to attend the 2021 gala dinner of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. First, I have the great privilege to read out the letter of congratulations from His Excellency Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China, to today's event. On the occasion of the 2021 annual event of the National Committee on United States-China Relations, I wish to express my appreciation and recognition to the committee and its member for your long-time dedication to the growth of China-U.S. relations and to the exchanges and the cooperation between our countries in various areas. The China-U.S. relationship is among the most important bilateral relationships in the world today. Whether our two countries, the world's biggest developing country and the biggest developed country, and the two permanent members of the UN Security Council can handle our relations well bears on the fundamental interests of the two countries and the peoples and matters to the future of the world. Right now, China-U.S. relations are at a critical historical juncture. Both countries will gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. Cooperation is the only right choice Following the principles of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation, China stands ready to work with the United States to enhance exchanges and cooperation across the board, jointly address regional and international issues, as well as global challenges, and in the meantime, properly manage differences so as to bring China-U.S. relations back to the right track of sound and steady development. I hope the committee will and all those who care for and support the development of China-U.S. relations will reinforce confidence, keep up your good work, and contribute even more wisdom and strength to the advancement of China-U.S. friendship and to the benefits of people in our two countries and around the world. S signed, Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, President Xi's letter of congratulations reflects China's positive attitude and position on developing China-U.S. relations. China's policy towards the U.S. is highly consistent and stable. We always bear in mind the fundamental interests of people of both countries and 
the whole world and handle China-U.S. relations from a strategic and a long-term perspective. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the National Committee on U.S.-China relations. 50 years are just like a flash in history. The historical achievements made in China-U.S. relations embodied the vision, wisdom, and hard efforts of generations of Chinese and American leaders, statesmen, and insightful people. I also wish to take this opportunity to extend sincere congratulations and pay high tribute to Mr. Ming Xie, this year's honoree. Thank you for your important efforts and the contributions to China-U.S. friendly exchanges and the practical cooperation. No doubt, our two countries and the whole world have been going through tremendous and profound changes. Some people say that China-U.S. relationship cannot go back to the past. But is it a reason why people can take it lightly or even damage it as they wish? No, we reject this view and this doing. Today, the interests of our two countries remain deeply integrated. Our shared responsibility for world peace, stability, and the prosperity remain unchanged. Our people remain passionate for friendship and exchanges with each other. And our mission to ensure stable growth of China-U.S. relations also remains the same as ever. Just as President Xi pointed out, both countries stand to gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. Cooperation was, is, and will always be the only right choice for us. In the past few years, China-U.S. relations have been seriously undermined. This does not serve the fundamental interests of the two peoples, nor is it consistent with the trend of the world. We look forward to working with the American government and the visionary people in the spirit of the phone call between our two presidents to strengthen dialogue manage differences, focus on cooperation, and make unremitting efforts to take China-U.S. relations back to the right track. I hope that the National Committee will continue to show leadership and play a great role in promoting the mutual understanding and the constructive cooperation between China and the U.S. So here I am, here I come at a very difficult and a challenging time. Just as Mr. Orleans just now quoted uh, Colin Powell said, you know, a good diplomat you know, is, has to be somebody you know, good at listening to. So here I come, I want to listen to, I want to communicate, I want to be a deliver. So I urge all of you who uh, care and love this important relationship to join me for the improvement of this vitally important relationship, not only for our two countries, but for the whole, whole world. Thank you so much for your attention. Well said, Ambassador Chin, and we will all take you up on that offer. On a night when we are honoring the contribution of Chinese Americans 
to American society. We are pleased to bring you an ensemble made up solely of Chinese Americans. I recall their performance in the White House during the presidency of Barack Obama, as well as such iconic, in such iconic venues as the Barclays Center and Madison Square Garden. Aptly called the joyous string ensemble, they are guaranteed to bring even more joy to an evening celebrating Chinese Americans. Good evening. We're the Joy String Ensemble, and I'm Justin Yu. We are very happy to be here this evening. The next piece we're going to perform is Isn't She Lovely by Stevie Wonder.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, Secretary Jacob Liu. Good, good evening uh, to all of our guests, uh, Ambassador Chin and Ambassador Nick Raponte. Secretaries Chow and Locke, Admiral Davidson, Consul General Huang, distinguished guests and friends of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our 2021 gala dinner. And what a delight it is to be able to gather in person to support the committee's vital work. This is my first gala as chair, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize my predecessor, Ambassador Carla Hills. <laughs> Following a path-breaking career in public service, Ambassador Hills has given two decades of remarkable service to this organization, and that service continues. We thank you for your unwavering commitment and leadership, and please join me in a rousing welcome and thank you. I also want to express my gratitude to Ming Xia, our honoree this evening, whose generosity sets an outstanding example and whose story is an inspiration. I'm likewise deeply thankful to our donors at the chair level and above, the Star Foundation, Fulgen Genetics, Citadel Securities, Dalio Philanthropies, Ex Coal Energy and Resources, BlackRock, Chubb, Perfect World, PX Global Advisors, Teng Yue Partners, Tishman Spire Properties, and Wangshang America Corporation, as well as all of our other sponsors and members of our gala committee who are listed in your program. At a time of enduring tension in U.S.-China relations, your leadership and commitment to building mutual understanding and exchanges at all levels provides continued hope that the relationship will grow more stable and productive. Finally, please join me in thanking our President Steve Orleans, our tireless Vice President Jan Barris, our gala team of Yang Lu, Uche Ushin Hinehan, Alexander Guido, Zachary Zulionis, and Garwood Events, as well as the rest of the dedicated staff of the National Committee. As we gather tonight, uh, the U.S.-China relationship is at a dangerous point, creating risks to both of our nations and the broader world. 
Escalating hostility may well play, play well politically in both of our countries, but it cannot be allowed to lead to either a full economic decoupling or even worse, to outright conflict. The world depends on its two largest economies, the US and China, to both grow at a healthy rate. Each faces pandemic-related interruptions as well as longer-term structural challenges. Acting in our respective national interests and defending our values lies at the heart of international engagement. But expanding barriers to trade and investment are increasing domestic economic challenges in our two economies and risk spillovers that could impede global growth. Stabilizing the relationship must be a shared priority and responsibility. That does not mean tolerating the economic or strategic status quo. It means engaging bilaterally and multilaterally to manage competition and to address shared transnational problems and to protect our values and national security interests. It means seeking a more predictable relationship. And that begins with increased communication. I'm encouraged by an increased pace of government-to-government -government talks and hope that we'll grow in frequency and the plans for the upcoming video between our two presidents is a promising development. We also know that track two dialogues like those that the committee facilitates can provide space for candid discussion. In particular, there's a vital role for those in the private sector, including many in this room, to build ties and help create a political climate in which progress is possible. And as we celebrate the contributions of those who immigrated to the United States, we must also recognize how important connections of family and culture can be to fostering understanding. Chinese American immigrants play a crucial role in keeping ties between our two nations strong. An early history of maltreatment and exclusion is a dark past. Recent incidents of anti-Asian violence are very troubling. But the overarching story is one of progress in which Chinese American immigrants have made foundational contributions to US society and become an integral part of our national fabric. As we celebrate that journey this evening, who is better to honor than Ming Xie, a Chinese American immigrant who rose to become a leading innovator, entrepreneur, and philanthropist in his adopted home? And to welcome tonight's honoree, I would like to now introduce former Secretary Elaine Chao. Secretary Chow is the first Asian American woman to serve in a president's cabinet. From 2017 to 2021, she served as Secretary of Transportation. Previously, from 2001 to 2009, she served as Secretary of Labor, during which time she participated in the U.S.-China Strategic Economic Dialogue and led the U.S. delegation to the closing ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. Secretary Chow has also served in various other positions in public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including as President and CEO of United Way, Director of the Peace Corps, Chair of the Federal Maritime Commission, Deputy Transportation Secretary, and as a banker with Citibank and Bank of America. Like tonight's honoree, Secretary Chow is also an immigrant to this nation, arriving in the U.S. from Taipei at age eight before earning her BA from Mount Holyoke College and her MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Chow. Thank you, Secretary Liu, for that overly generous introduction. It's wonderful to be here with all of you in person as well. Thank you for inviting me to share a few thoughts this evening in advance of my introduction of our honoree. For 55 years, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations has played an important role in encouraging better understanding between the people of China and the United States. You have promoted open dialogue between the two countries with the goal of enhancing mutual understanding and promoting a stable, productive relationship. Today, the U.S.-China relationship 
is in one of its most sensitive and challenging stages since 1979. In the US, liberal and conservative policymakers from both political parties are unusually aligned in criticizing China. In addition, most reporting on China in the American media are negative or suspicious in tone. Against this backdrop, I would like to urge and encourage all of us to remain vigilant. We must ensure that the difficult relations between our two countries do not turn into anti-Asian hate or negative sentiments or violence that harm the Asian American community, whose contribution to America you have heard so much about. And that's why I'm so glad to see the formation of new organizations established to give voice to Asian American concerns. And I want to in particular call out Mr. Peng Zhao, who has participated in the founding of the Asian American Foundation. <laughs> American ideals are what draws the rest of the world to our shores. And it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure that those dreams and ideals remain. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ming She, of whom you've heard so much about. He exemplifies all the traits that have enabled Americans of Chinese ancestry to contribute so much to our country. As you know and have heard, Ming She is renowned as a gifted innovator, highly successful entrepreneur, and a very generous philanthropist. You may not know the rest of his journey, so let me share that with you. Ming came to the United States with the hope of contributing to society by building upon the achievements of his father, a professor and scientist at the China Electric Power Research Institute. Ming started out in 1981 as a junior transfer student to the University of Southern California from the Southern China Science and Technology University. He earned a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master's Degree from USC. But like so many immigrants, his new life in America brought many personal and professional challenges, including a significant language barrier and major cultural adjustments. And he also had to work multiple jobs to pay for his tuition and living expenses. But he persevered and thrived on these challenges, which helped to make him into the success that he is today. Because Ming founded Cogent Systems, which under his direction became a global leader in providing biometric identification systems for law enforcement and government agencies our government. He went on to found Fugent Genetics, which became a leading cancer genetic diagnostic company. And it goes without saying that both these companies have made significant contributions to our country in the security and healthcare sectors. Now, always looking for new ways to make a difference, Ming has recently overseen Fugent's rapid pivot to creating testing and vaccination solutions to help combat COVID-19. And he's also worked with CDC to track and disseminate information to combat variants as well. Ming's achievements in science and engineering have not gone unnoticed by leaders in the industry. He was elected to the US National Academy of Engineers, one of the highest professional honors in engineering. He was also named a fellow of the National Academy of Investors for his innovation and biometric identification technology. And during his service at the National Academy of Engineering, Ming has worked to promote a global collaboration between the US National Academy of Engineering 
the China National Academy of Engineering, and the UK Royal Academy of Engineering. Ming was also the recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and his personal story has been archived at the National Museum of American History. As his innovations attest, Ming is passionate about improving the lives of others, not only by creating new solutions and opportunity, but through his extensive philanthropic efforts as well. He has donated more than $100 million to support research, educational, and medical institutions that promote scientific advancement, fight cancer, and support global engineering collaborations. His generosity, along with Dr. Henry Kissinger and Rupert Murdoch, enabled the Nixon Library's China Pavilion, Pavilion to tell the story of the week that changed the world. For all these achievements, especially his seminal contributions to science, engineering, healthcare, and philanthropy, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's honoree, Ming She. So many thanks to Secretary Chow for such a very kind and very generous word and the introduction. Dear estimate the, the guests, Ambassador Qinggang and Ambassador Geng Shuang, Secretary Jack Lu and the Governor Gary Locke, dear all the colleagues and the friends at the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations. To all the sponsors, friends, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm very humbled and honored to be here today to receive this award. And would like to thank the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations for their recognition and support. I want to also thank Dr. Kissinger for his heartwarming messages as an immigrant and as a colleague. I was born in Xinjiang, a northwestern industrial city in China. My father was a research scientist, and my mother was a high school literature teacher. I had very happy and cheerful childhood until the beginning of the Cultural Revolution in 1966. Like most intellectuals during the Cultural Revolution, our family was sent to a remote village to do farm work in Panjing County, Liaoning Province for so-called re-education in 1970. In the village, there was no paved road, no electricity, no fresh water, and even worse, there was no school. Effectively, my formal education ended before I started middle school. Instead, I had to do hand manual work 
of labor in the fields, pulling the weeds, plow the fields, shoveling the manure from sunrise to sunset in a tough environment. However, I was lucky since my parents were both educators. They ensured I was getting an education from whatever resources they had. During the off season, my father created handwritten textbooks and taught me physics, mathematics, and electronics in an application manner. I became his assistant in pulling the wires, climbing the poles, and setting up the transformers. Through his ingenuity, we successfully brought electricity into our village. My father inspired me in interest in engineering, science, and more importantly, my drive for community service through solving problems. I dreamed that one day I could study in a university and become an electrical engineer like my father. But as a farmer in a rural village, all that seems like a very remote fantasy. I had a vivid memory on a special day in 1971. I was working in the field and heard an announcement from a loudspeaker that Dr. Kissinger made a historical trip to Beijing and arranged President Nixon's first visit to China. I didn't know how that visit could impact my personal life during that time, but I sensed something very important, change will be happening in China. I wish Dr. Kissinger's tonight's video could deliver them in advance 50 years ago, which would be a powerful recommendation for my reference for college admissions. <laughs> yeah, probably now is not uh, for the case in the US now. <laughs> so that trip begins the normalization of China and the US relationships and accelerate China's reform. With subsequent establishment for the National College Entrance Exam System in China, I became one of the first group of students to enter university since the Cultural Revolution. So we call that now class of 1977. Three years later, I was able to transfer to the renowned University of Southern California and begin my American dream. I was very grateful that the stable and the corrupt U.S.-China relations allow me to change from a field farmer to a member of the National Academy of Engineering and Science. I am a beneficiary of these relationships. To prepare tonight's gala, and I had a, a talk with Dr. Kissinger. I told him about this story. And he was very calm and did not answer immediately. And he told me, me, I know many farmers in 70s. So I paused a little bit 
and start to count. The current foreign minister, Wang Yi, was a farmer. The West Premier, Liu He, was a farmer. Premier Li Keqiang was a farmer. And the President Xi Jinping was also a farmer. To extend more, and the President Jimmy Carter was also a farmer. <laughs> but there is a fundamental difference in definition of a farmer. In China, farmer, you had to really work. <laughs> so, yes, since the ice breaking bilateral relationship in 1971, China and US has worked together and brought a tangible benefit, not only to myself, but hundreds of millions of people in both countries and the world through globalization. I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity and the success that my immigration from China to US has afforded me. But I will never forget my origin and remain grateful to China for insulating my science and engineering enlightenment. To me, the best way to honor and give back to the country that raised me and also the country that provide me with the opportunity to thrive is through supporting the education and the preservation of heritage. I'm very much looking forward to continue to work with the National Committee of U.S. and China Relations to achieve our mission. I would like also at this time, using this opportunity to thank Secretary Chao again. She has dedicated her life for public service and also has generously mentored me for many years and introduced me to this committee and to the Nixon Foundation and also to the Committee of 100. And today we also have the, you know, and you mentioned the government Gary Lock, it is uh, Committee 100's current chairman. I don't know where is the, the, our chairman. So. <laughs> so the, I almost lost the, not only the, our governor and chairman, I lost my sentence here. So for all these organizations I involved, is all in the one common goal, is promoting open dialogue between the two countries, and with the goal of enhancing mutual understandings and promoting the stable, constructive relationships between our two countries. So after this gala, we have a lot of work to do. So many thanks for this is a great honor and many thanks for all your support tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mingxia, for those moving and thoughtful remarks. And now, as we bring uh, this evening uh, to a close, I want to express uh, my gratitude again to everyone who made tonight possible. And our deepest thanks uh, to all of you for being here with us and for your steadfast support 
uh, during this critical time in U.S.-China relations. We look forward to your continued engagement in our efforts to improve understanding and cooperation between the United States and China. And I wish you all a good evening and a safe journey home. Thank you very much.